So first of all, welcome here to the European Astronaut Center. As you can see, we are in a little bit special condition still uh, with the mask. We have actually true crew training going on right here today. And uh, yes, uh, we are still in uh, uh, lockdown, if you can call it like that. Uh, most of the people are teleworking and the people that have to come to work uh, still have to wear uh, masks. We uh, make a little bit of exceptions. Uh, for example, if we have to do an interview, this is I think the third or fourth interview overall with all the astronauts that we are organizing since, uh, since March. So it's really exceptional and for interviews indeed, we have the authority to remove the mask as long as there is sufficient distance. So I see you sitting at least three meters away from me. So I'm allowed to uh, remove the mask. So thank you very much because of course it's not always easy uh, also for the people here that have to work uh, to constantly have to wear their masks. Uh, I became uh, a pilot uh, because I wanted to do this since I was uh, 10, 12 years old. Uh, when I was a young boy, I visited actually here in Cologne, uh, because we're here in the astronaut center in Cologne, uh, an uncle of me who was at that moment a helicopter pilot in the uh, armed forces, the Belgian armed forces. And uh, I found it so fascinating. We could uh, visit the base here. And it was still the time where we had uh, Belgian military people here in, in Germany uh, at the height of the, the Cold War. And I found it so fascinating that I absolutely wanted to become a pilot as well. And the best chance for me to do that at that time was to go to the Cadet uh, uh, School, as we say in Dutch, Ecole uh, Royale des Cadets. Uh, so from my 15 years old, basically, I'm in the military. Uh, I learned uh, discipline. I learned uh, uh, to get up early in the morning, which I still do, uh, uh, to study well. And uh, the next step, of course, beyond the, uh, the high school there in the military was then the military academy. Uh, in which I was uh, uh, then studying as an engineer but I entered there already to become a pilot uh, in the Air Force. So uh, I started with my first uh, lessons flying in the uh, Air Cadets because that was then uh, part of the education uh, while the uh, other people that were doing university studies in the months of uh, July, August, September, they were off. Uh, we had our military training. And so part of the military training then was, first of all, with fly with the air cadets and later on start my formal uh, pilot training uh, on Marchetti in, in Gutsenhoven. So I basically combined then my studies as an engineer uh, and my studies to become a pilot. And it's basically uh, two things that I love very much. There are actually three things that I love very much. One thing is flying, being uh, working with uh, yeah, uh, advanced machines, uh, uh, complicated machines, and being able to control them to the best of my ability, uh, be it then in an aircraft or be it in space later. The other thing is to be an engineer, to be a scientist, and to, to be able to conceive systems, uh, to, to test systems, to see how we can make them better. And the, the third aspect is working with people. And I have been extremely fortunate that uh, throughout my career, I have been uh, able to do that. Uh, of course, if you work in the military, it's clear that uh, as from the moment that you enter in the military, you're in the community, be it in the Ecole des Cadets, be it in uh, military school, be it later on in the Air Force, in the squadron, you're part of a group, you're part of a community where there is both leadership and followership that is, uh, that is required. So working with people, leadership is the essence, of course, uh, of the, the military business as well. But at the same time, then being a pilot, uh, being an engineer, and then very early on in my career, and the military, the, the Air Force, the Belgian Air Force, decided to modernize our Mirage aircraft. So there I was able to expand on my engineering capabilities because I was detached to the company in France that would make the upgrade, the avionics upgrade of our Mirage aircraft. And then from there on, later on, I was even able to become a test pilot, which is even a closer link between engineering and flying. And just after that, uh, okay, then I became the squadron commander of uh, uh, 349 Squadron, again, working with people, leading people. And that was then 
my last step in the Air Force because I then joined the European Space Agency to become an astronaut and then I could start from the modern again because yeah, I was new in this business so I was again not in charge of people but just learning how to fly to space like 20 years earlier I was learning how to fly on aircraft. Okay. During my career in the Air Force I was also involved in uh, a number of test programs because uh, we had of course our aircraft that were bought in the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, but all of them needed modernization. It was the time that not every time an aircraft was bought completely new but that there were a lot of modernizations ongoing on. The first one we already talked a little bit about it was the Mirage upgrade. Uh, when I was still a pilot I, uh, as an engineer I went to the company to help design the avionic system for our Mirage upgrade. But then uh, I went to test pilot school and when I came back actually the upgrade was finished and the aircraft needed to be tested. So it was my first full test program in which I was involved. This was the upgrade of our Mirage uh, systems. Uh, then later on we also modernized our F-16s because uh, what we saw during the conflicts that were starting at that moment, especially the, the first Gulf War, that our F-16 was not equipped with electronic countermeasures. And this was of course not satisfactory in a new high technological warfare that was uh, uh, starting to develop at that time. So the Air Force decided to modernize and to install a complete brand new electronic warning system uh, in our uh, F-16s. I was not so much involved in the development in it, that were the technical people more from the air staff, but again once the system was developed we had to test it to make sure that it was uh, fulfilling all the specifications. So for that I was in Eglin Air Force Base because they have a very specific test range there where they can simulate all kind of that time the Russian uh, electronic uh, missile systems, uh, SA-8, uh, SA-2, SA-3 and so on. And so I was there in Eglin Air Force Base for three months uh, to test our system, not only to test it but also to do all the analysis of all the signals and all the inputs that were, were coming in uh, and to help the engineers figuring out what was good and what was not so good with, uh, with the system. Later on I was also involved with the uh, C-130 because we also upgraded it, our C-130. Again, we installed a uh, protective system, uh, infrared protective system that could launch flares uh, against uh, uh, incoming infrared missiles and we also upgraded the avionic system of our C-130 aircraft. But the biggest program that I was involved with of course was the midlife update of our F-16s, uh, a midlife update that is still being used today. Uh, in which we really uh, brought our F-16s that were bought in the 80s to a new era uh, where we could uh, uh, fly with advanced weapon systems like targeting pods, like uh, uh, new radar systems, like uh, new missiles that, uh, that were integrated and for that program I was uh, more than a year in Edwards Air Force Base uh, one of the, the greatest test bases of course in, in the world where you have uh, an enormous uh, area that is unpopulated there above the desert where you can do all kinds of uh, crazy tests and I've done the, the most crazy flying in my career there uh, above Air Force uh, in uh, Edwards Air Force Base and that was in the 96-97 the time frame. Uh, and then when I came back I had the pleasure again to work with the MLU uh, aircraft, the midlife update aircraft because it uh, came uh, then in service in 349 squadron. 349 squadron was the first squadron that was uh, transformed or that uh, got the new MLU aircraft that had to start a complete new training program and I was lucky enough at that moment to be appointed the squadron commander of 349 squadron so the aircraft that I tested and that had helped to make the best possible aircraft for operations I then had to also uh, fly it and uh, put into operations myself uh, in 349 squadron and then very soon after the introduction of the aircraft actually uh, we were called to go and support NATO in the Kosovo uh, war 
uh, in the Operations Allied Force. So, uh, in 1999, the 349 Squadron was called to support the Operations Allied Force in the Balkan. And there was a big crisis going on in the Balkan at that moment uh, in Kosovo, but uh, also before in, in Croatia with, with Serbia. Uh, and so the, the politicians decided that uh, NATO should intervene and should stop the, try to stop the hostilities there, uh, first of all, with the use of uh, air power. So we were uh, indeed uh, transferred to Amandola Air Force Base where there was a mixed detachment. It was actually unique uh, that we had uh, a Dutch and Belgium uh, detachment uh, working together, closely working together, fully integrated in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, operations under a single command. And uh, so when I arrived in, in the Balkan there, after uh, a couple of weeks, I took over the command from the previous Dutch commander and I became the first Belgian detachment commander actually of a uh, squadron that was in real operations, in wartime operations, uh, since the uh, last one that was before, that was actually in Korea, I think, uh, before that, because during the Cold War, of course, we were all uh, sitting on our air bases, but there was no real conflict going on. Here, we really were flying in conflict area where people were flying uh, at night during the day, getting shot at. Uh, and that's of course not easy because a lot of the pilots that were recruited, myself included, we were recruited in the midst of the war, Cold War. We never thought that there would become a conflict because a conflict that would be, okay, the Russians against uh, NATO, it would be the end of the world. So it was a very stable situation actually at that moment. But then with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, everything became much more dynamic. Uh, and then we saw that for the first time, we were actually called to go into real, real operations. And for a lot of people, uh, this was fully new. It was also a little bit of shock. It was a lot of stress that we had there and we had to deal with that. Uh, uh, some of our pilots were uh, very good pilots, excellent pilots uh, in the exercises, all the exercises that we did. But when it came to real operations where they were being shot at, uh, all of a sudden were not so much capable of handling this distress anymore because it was completely new. It was also not something that we were really prepared for. I think the, the young pilots that are recruited now, they are much more prepared for that, of course, because they have a whole generation of older pilots that can tell them the stories, that can bring this expertise of real operations to them. It's also very common now that the Air Force is deployed in real conflict operations where they have to drop bombs, where they have to shoot missiles, real bombs, real missiles, something that my generation of pilots never had to do before. So that was very unique. Uh, it was also unique in the sense that our Dutch colleagues actually had much more advanced weapons than, than we had uh, at that time. They had, for example, targeting pots, they had smart bombs that at that moment the Belgian Air Force did not have yet. So I also had to work with the air staff a lot uh, to see how could we enhance the capabilities of our uh, deployment of our Belgian aircraft as well to really be at the, the same level of our NATO partners because of course when you are in deployment, uh, when you participate in a real mission, uh, you want to be uh, at the same level of the partners. Uh, you don't want to, to just hang behind or, or just do only the support missions. Uh, I think if you're a good partner, you need to be capable of doing the same missions as your partners are doing. And uh, so we worked very hard with the, the Air Force in order to establish in very short term this capability, which we actually acquired. So in the three months time that we were there, we went from a squadron 349 that was uh, basically an uh, air superiority squadron at that moment in the Cold War, uh, being pure fighter, 
to a squadron that was transformed to fighter bomber with the most advanced weapons and we did all that during the, the conflict itself so it was uh, quite an achievement I would say of, of the crew of the pilots of the trainers uh, back in, in Belgium of course that trained these pilots uh, before uh, they came to us in, uh, in Amendola. My dream to become an astronaut actually started already when I was in the high school. It was a time of the discoveries of uh, uh, supernovas, uh, black holes, so I, I read a lot of stories about it and it was also the time of the, the series Star Trek. I'm a big fan of Star Trek uh, and I always wanted to sit in this uh, big chair in the middle of the starship and say warp night engage and that has always been a, a dream of me. Uh, and then when I uh, joined the military academy to become a pilot and an engineer, the space shuttle flew for the first time. So I actually uh, thought about uh, writing to, to NASA and to ask them uh, what do I need to do uh, to become an, an astronaut and uh, looking to the profiles of course being a scientist, being an engineer and being a pilot uh, is of course uh, one of the, the best criteria at that time uh, to become an astronaut. And then in uh, a couple of years later actually in 89 uh, I saw an uh, advert in the newspaper, the Standard, which said the European A Space Agency is looking for astronauts. So, of course, I immediately applied. Uh, I know very well that uh, my application letter, I brought it myself to Brussels, uh, to the, to the uh, office where you had to dispose your letter just to make sure that it would not get lost in the post eh? because that would have been the, the drama of course. Uh, so I wanted absolutely to, to be part of that uh, selection. Uh, but some of my friends did as well. Uh, some of my good friends that were uh, part of my uh, uh, class uh, also in the military academy but uh, also in, in the Air Force. Some of my Air Force uh, pilot colleagues of course uh, they, they also had this dream and they also wanted to apply and, and become astronauts uh, and so we all went through the selection process which at that stage first was a selection process organized by the Belgium uh, uh, organization that was responsible for space in cooperation with the Air Force actually and because a lot of the tests we did at uh, uh, the Center for Aerospace uh, Medicine uh, at that moment but of course the tests were uh, more advanced and then at the end of the Belgian selection well we were five candidates that were left uh, that were presented to uh, ESA and that was in uh, 1991 so this whole process took about uh, I would say uh, uh, one year uh, it was actually uh, a little bit funny as well because you know when you go through a selection process like this also now in ESA it's basically uh, a step-by-step -step process. You first do some very easy tests. For example, can you speak English? Uh, it's a very easy test to take and then a number of people drop out. Then you do some easy, easy medical tests. Then you do some psychological tests. So it's actually step-by-step -step. and during this whole selection uh, process I was actually studying to become a major in the KID, uh, so in the, the Institute of uh, Higher Defense in, uh, in the Air Force or in the Armed Forces. And so every time that there was a new test, I had to go and ask permission uh, to, the, to the boss there, to the colonel who was in charge to miss or to skip classes for half a day or a day because I had to go and do, do my test. So when I was in the third or the fourth round, I went back to him and said, now, now it's enough, you have done it three times, now it's enough, now you can't participate anymore, <laughs> which was a little bit, of course, not the whole aim. Uh, so I had to go one step higher and uh, actually ask the general of the, that was in charge then of the, uh, of the school uh, to, to, to be able to continue my tests, which uh, luckily he granted. And so uh, at the end, I could make it to the ESA selection. In the ESA selection, we repeated a lot of the tests actually uh, at that time. And then in 1992, ESA made the, the final selection uh, or recruitment uh, uh, public. Uh, I was in the final two for Belgium in the final 20 I would say of the ESA selection but at that moment I was not recruited. Uh, Marianne Mercier 
was recruited at that moment in 1992. Uh, very capable lady, pilot, uh, doctor, so she had all the, the re prerequisites to become uh, uh, an astronaut. But throughout her career in ESA, she decided to take another route. So she decided to leave ESA at a certain moment. And then in 1998, uh, the uh, European Astronaut Center, where we are today, was created with a single European Astronaut Corps. Before we had a European Corps, we had a French Corps, a German Corps, an Italian Corps. And so the member states decided to put all these resources together and to form one single European Astronaut Corps with the home base here at the European Astronaut Center. And as part of that exercise, they did a Delta recruitment from the people that were uh, still left over from the selection in 1992. And so since Belgium did not have a representative in the core, uh, but Belgium is a big contributor of ESA, uh, I had the chance to be recruited in 1998. But actually at that time there were no real training and flights uh, going on. Uh, so it was decided to leave me in the Air Force for another two years, exactly at the moment that I became commander of 349, because it was deemed also interesting for ESA to give me, me this command experience uh, and to, to be the boss of, uh, of a squadron, which actually served me very well later, because of course this command experience came uh, very well in place when I became the commander of the International Space Station in 2009. So in 2000, uh, I finally joined uh, the European Space Agency and the European Astronaut Corps. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, I had actually to go and work in ASTEC, our technology center, because our Columbus module was not ready to launch. Uh, we had very little training and we had actually very little flight opportunities. Uh, but then again, I got lucky again because the uh, space agency uh, had an agreement or was managed to forge an agreement with our colleagues from Roscosmos uh, from Russia to have a number of additional flight opportunities uh, for the young astronauts that had not flown before short missions, 10-day missions on a Soyuz. We called them at that time a taxi mission because basically we went up to the space station to exchange the existing Soyuz and came back with the, with the new Soyuz and came back with, with the old Soyuz. And uh, those missions, uh, ESA did not have the money for those missions, but they offered them to the member states for them to be able to purchase those missions because they were purchased kind of in a bulk at a, at a cheaper rate than uh, the member states could uh, acquire them alone. And France was actually the first uh, country to, to acquire some of those missions for Claudie and Yere. Afterwards came uh, Italy with uh, Roberto Vittori, but uh, Belgium was the third uh, country to acquire such a mission. Afterwards there were still the Dutch and also the Spanish that acquired such a mission. So this was my opportunity. So very early on in my career, only about after uh, uh, one year, uh, I was summoned to go to uh, Star City and to start my training for my first uh, Soyuz mission. Now, uh, you have to understand that if you fly Soyuz, all the lessons are in Russian. Today we have uh, still a lot of documentation that is already translated in English. At that time there was no books. Everything was still taught on a blackboard with crayon. So, and you had a translator of course in the beginning next to you. Uh, but this was uh, uh, the biggest challenge for me was actually to learn and to understand this Russian language because all the board documentation was in Russian. All the communications also with the grant were in Russian. So we had uh, I was very lucky to have a very good teacher, Zinaida Nikolaevna. Uh, she taught a lot of uh, the European astronaut Russian language. Uh, she was in her 70s. Uh, she came all the way two hours from the center of Moscow to Star City in the morning via metro and train and then by car uh, to give us four hours of Russian language every day. And then she returned in, in the evening. So we started indeed by uh, the first five months, four hours every single day, 
Russian language. And then in the evening, we had exercises, tasks to learn the alphabet, to learn how to write, uh, to learn how to spell. So it was uh, uh, quite uh, intensive time uh, at that moment. Uh, but I, I, again, it uh, was very fruitful because after four months, I, I remember very well, I started in August and in November was the first exam that I could take without having to use the translator. Uh, of course, it was still very basic. Uh, uh, you don't speak in full sentences. You say valve, open, valve, closed, push, button, things like that. But at least I could make myself understand and I could uh, make sure that the, the teachers, the people that examined me, could understand that I had a good knowledge of, of the system and that the language was, uh, was coming there. So uh, that was a very first uh, big uh, step uh, for me. And then yeah, the training continued. And so finally in uh, 2002, October 2002, I could do my first mission to the International Space Station. Um, quite unique, actually, this mission as well, because we flew with two different types of uh, Soyuz. We flew with the, so the old Soyuz, which was still a, a very archaic analog system. Uh, a lot of the computers was, were, were still analog, with a new Soyuz, which was called the TMA, Soyuz TMA. And so my spacecraft was called the Soyuz TMA-1, uh, which was a new digital system. Uh, and for the first time, uh, they flew with a digital Soyuz to, to the space station. And not only was I flying on two vehicles, I was also the board engineer. Uh, so I was the first uh, non-Russian to fly in a test flight because the TMA-1 was, uh, was a test flight and not only was I the first one to fly in a test flight, I was also the board engineer, so the one that who would have to operate all the systems during the flight in a test flight. So uh, it showed, of course, also the confidence that uh, the Russians had in my abilities to work with the crew, to work with the commander and to bring this mission uh, to a success. So uh, there are, of course, a number of anecdotes. Uh, we, we were doing training and so we had now for the first time this, uh, this screens uh, instead of the, all the analog buttons in front of us. And then there were all the discussions, okay, what happens if a screen fails? You were on the launch pad, you were still not in orbit, but the screen failed. Do you still launch? Yes, we still launch. <laughs> so there were a lot of things like that when I, uh, when we sat in the in the spacecraft uh, on the launch pad itself, the day of the launch, we powered on all the, all the systems, and all of a sudden everything went red. We had no more telemetry, we had no more parameters, uh, and so we were trying some things, nothing worked, and then we called the grand, say, okay, guys, what do you do? And it's a little bit like the computer, remove all the power and put all the power back on. So we switched off all the power in the whole spacecraft, power the spacecraft back up, and then it worked. And you go and sit there on the launch pad and say, okay, shall we fly or not? So it was a, a little bit of a, uh, it was a real test flight. Huh? Uh, and we, of course, discovered uh, a number of uh, problems, issues uh, during the flight, none of them critical, because I must say the, the Soyuz spacecraft is a very, very safe spacecraft. Even if all the computers would have failed during the flight, we would still have been able to make a safe landing back on Earth. So the safety was never in question. Uh, the whole question was, of course, more about the mission success. Will we be able to, to fly a good mission and, and to talk to the international Space Station, but again, apart from a small hiccup here and there, we were able to have a very successful mission. And of course, once on board on the ISS, we had a very comprehensive Belgian scientific program. We had more than 21 experiments. Most of them worked well. Of course, we had a, a number of failures, like you always have when you when you fly to space. Uh, but in general, this was a, a very very successful mission. So, of course, it's clear when. Uh, you fly to space uh, and you're not the first one but the second one as a Belgian astronaut to do that, that uh, there is a lot of attention that is given to you as a person. Uh, and of course from one day to the other, uh, more or less, I became famous in Belgium. So when I went to a restaurant or I walked out, well, uh, people recognized me. Uh, it's not something that you're particularly trained for. 
as an astronaut. Uh, of course, today with the social media, our astronauts have it a lot more. Uh, they, they, they have more than a million followers on, on social media. So it's even worse for them now today than it was for me, because it's also something that as an astronaut, you do not want. You want to fly, you want to do your job, you want to do science, you want to do operations. Uh, it's not the aim to become famous. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also necessary because 20% of uh, our job as astronauts, 10 to 20%, is indeed doing what we call public relations. Go to conferences, uh, talk about our experiences, tell people why it's important that we invest in space, not only in space and exploration, but space in general. Yeah? Uh, look to the communications, uh, the weather forecast, uh, everything to do with climate change. So it's a very important aspect uh, uh, of the life of an astronaut is to communicate. Uh, to talk with uh, the public at large, but also with the decision makers, uh, because at the end, uh, like any other business, uh, space needs funding. Space needs money from uh, uh, all of you that are watching, from the, the taxpayer. Uh, and so that is coming through politicians. So we need to convince them as well that the money that they spent is good money and is well invested. Uh, uh, and astronauts, of course, can play uh, a very good uh, role in that. I was not used to that role, I was not trained for it. So yeah, so you, you learn this of course, uh, step by step as well. Uh, when you come back uh, in the beginning, sitting with, uh, with ministers and with the prime minister is not that easy today. Uh, it's a little bit easier for me because you have done this a number of times. Uh, uh, it's clear that uh, this is also part of your career evolution, uh, I would say. Uh, part of the job then as well, when I came back, is that the European Union started to be interested in space. Today we all know that the EU has big space programs like Galileo, like Copernicus. Well, uh, 20 years ago, uh, this was just at the start. Uh, there was a big debate ongoing, should the EU be involved in space or not? And in the normal EU process, you do this through what we call a green book and a white book. And a green book, you ask questions to the community at large, uh, the general public, but also institutions, researchers, industry, politicians, uh, what should the EU do in this, uh, in this area? And then following all these uh, questionnaires, these workshops, uh, conferences, there is kind of a white book which says this is what the EU proposes uh, to do. And during that uh, period, which was just after my flight, 2003-2004, I worked actually in the European Commission uh, for two years uh, part-time to help uh, guide this process, uh, especially, of course, related to space exploration. And I had the occasion uh, at that time, several times, to meet with the uh, commissioner at that time, Mr. Busquin, who was the, the Belgian commissioner that was responsible for research and development, and uh, also the space sector was uh, under his uh, competence. So there I learned much more to work with member states, to work with politics, uh, how does politics influence decisions? Uh, again, something that uh, serves me quite well now in, uh, in the job that I'm doing uh, right now uh, as the head of the center here uh, and now also as the head of the ISS program, working with member states, uh, working with uh, the program boards uh, that uh, tell us uh, how we should execute our programs. And then soon after that, uh, Columbus was going to get launched in 2008. The astronaut assigned uh, for that mission was uh, Leopold Erhards, uh, my very good uh, French uh, colleague and friend, and uh, they needed a backup for that flight. And so they asked uh, who could uh, or who would be willing to be the backup of, uh, of Leopold. Uh, and of course, although uh, politics and uh, working with member states and building programs is very interesting. My interest uh, was and is still flying and uh, flying in space. So I was uh, immediately, of course, a candidate to, to become the backup of Leopold. Uh, and so I went back into training, uh, training this time much more in Houston because the flight of Leopold was with the space shuttle. Uh, so I also trained for the, the space shuttle flight, uh, of course, for the, the, the work on board of the uh, space station to install our Columbus module, although the chance was very low that I would fly, I knew 
but still it was an investment again in my future career because all the training that I did for uh, the space station I was sure would uh, become handy again and, and indeed uh, Leopold flew then finally in 2008 to the International Space Station uh, with the Columbus uh, module and very soon after that it was decided that we would upgrade the ISS from three crew members to six crew members uh, and that first flight would be in May 2009 and it was decided at that time as well that for that fl first flight they would have all the partners represented at the International Space Station. So a Japanese, Canadian, Russian, American and also European astronaut. And so at that moment they needed to select very quickly a European astronaut to fly that mission. Uh, and I was the one that was already trained because I was just coming out of the backup training of, of Leopold. The time to the flight was very short, so there was uh, only one natural candidate to select for that mission, and it was myself. So once again, I found myself in a very lucky place. So then I was selected for my second flight in 2009, this time a long duration space flight. Of course, the long duration space flight is totally different than a short flight. A short flight is 10 days, okay, it's like you leave on an extended holiday, yeah, it's a little bit far away, it's a little bit exotic, but after 10 days you're back uh, on the ground and you're back with your family. Six months in the International Space Station is of course totally different. Uh, you're away for a long time. Uh, your body of course completely changes over six months uh, so long in space. You're away for a very long time from uh, uh, your friends, your family, uh, your kids. Uh, we have all witnessed it a little bit now in, in Corona. Yeah, when I read some of the articles how difficult it is that you can't hug anybody or you can't hug your kids or whatever, you have to imagine that you're doing this for six months. I know it's voluntary of course eh, when you go to the space station, uh, it's, it's different than uh, having it mandatory done but still what you miss is the same thing that a lot of people missed uh, here during the lockdown. You don't have this very close intense contact with other human beings which as uh, social creatures that uh, that we are that uh, that you all need on the other hand of course you have a lot of great things that you can experience you can watch our planet uh, go by for six months uh, see the different seasons uh, it's a beautiful view you also see the fragility of our planet of course yeah? there's a very thin layer of oxygen air that uh, supports us and we all know that uh, with what we are doing today uh, we are not going to preserve our planet uh, for a very long time in good conditions of course the planet will still be there uh, whatever we do uh, the, we also say it's the uh, climate change is, uh, is dangerous for the planet no it's not dangerous for the planet the planet will be there and life will persist there is life that is uh, in, in the planet on the on the surface now or in the oceans uh, living in much more difficult conditions but it's dangerous for us Will we be able to survive uh, what we are doing to the climate? And that's, uh, that's what we have uh, to see because life, of course, will persist at any time in, uh, in the planet in the foreseeable future. Uh, so you see that. You also see that uh, our planet, uh, our countries, actually borders do not exist. Huh? And then coming from the military with the previous experience as well, in conflicts and then seeing from above that yeah you cannot see a border between Serbia and Kosovo or between Ukraine and Russia or uh, between Syria and Egypt and Israel uh, these are just all imaginary lines that at some point in history 500 years ago 300 150 years ago people have drawn on a map and now we're fighting over those lines and so it makes you realize how small and insignificant we are in this immense universe and that we still cannot manage to live together in a peaceful way. It, uh, it really gives a, a very big impression, much more of course during a six month flight because you have time to absorb all this during a short mission. Okay, you're so busy with your experiments, with everything is new that, that you don't have time to realize all this during the six-month mission, of course. It's much more intense. 
And then, of course, you also forge friendships that still exist through today uh, with my uh, Canadian colleague, uh, Bob Tursk, uh, with my Russian uh, friend, Roman Romanenko. Uh, we're still uh, exchanging WhatsApp uh, a couple of times a week. Uh, we're still in touch a lot. We try to see each other uh, very often a little bit less today with uh, the corona crisis, uh, uh, let's face it, but uh, still uh, we, uh, we are very good friends and so all this of course stays with you throughout your, your career. At the end uh, I also had the big opportunity and the big chance and the privilege to become the commander of the International Space Station, the first non-American, non-Russian uh, commander of the, of the ISS. Uh, of course, I tried to do my job as good as possible. Uh, in the meantime, we have had Canadian, Japanese commanders and also our young astronauts that flew after me, uh, Luca Parmitano, Alexander Garst, have been commanders of the space station. So most probably I have not done a too bad job because uh, the, the, the program has been continued and also the smaller partners can have command of, of the ISS. And again, this has helped me a lot in my future career, of course, because after my space flight, after the initial period, again, of debriefings, uh, working with the scientists, going to conferences, uh, it was time for me to take another step in my career and to move to the management of the European Space Agency, to move to the management of the European astronauts and to become here the head of the European Astronaut Center. And of course in this capability I'm working a lot with our international partners uh, to negotiate, to defend the interest of Europe. I'm working with our European member states to defend uh, and, and to promote the interest of our space exploration programs to get the necessary funding to continue our programs and of course in that respect uh, the leadership function that I have had in the ISS and the credibility that I have uh, due to the, the fact that I had this position in the past is helping a lot Europe in uh, moving further into exploration. So now I'm responsible here for the European Astronaut Center, uh, for the European astronauts, but much more than that I'm working of course with the management within my directorate to try to build the future of space in Europe and especially space exploration in Europe. Since uh, five years now we have built on what we call the European Exploration Envelope Program. It's basically a program that encompasses everything that Europe and ESA wants to do in space exploration. Uh, we think that this is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we talked about technology, innovations. Yeah? Space programs bring technology, they bring innovation to the, uh, uh, to the industry, innovation that we can use in uh, a lot of other domains. Secondly, uh, science uh, is the core business, why do we explore, why do we went to space, uh, what can we discover and science is, is, is the big component uh, as well of the International Space Station. Our astronauts do scientific activities in a whole lot of domains. Uh, we are doing science on Mars, on the Moon, so uh, bringing knowledge to our society is very important if we want to project ourselves in the future. Uh, thirdly, the big component of exploration is international cooperation. We see today that uh, in the world it's difficult for countries to work together. Think about the situation between China, America and Russia today. Uh, in fact, in exploration, in, in human spaceflight, cooperation has always been possible. At the heights of the Cold War, we had Soyuz Apollo missions. Uh, now we have the International Space Station where Russia and the US are still working together. We have here American and Russian cosmonauts training together here in the European Astronaut Center today uh, while we are doing this, this interview. So we, we find ways to, to bridge the differences and to continue to work together. And so international cooperation is one of the big drivers why Europe invests into space exploration. And then finally, inspiration. Uh, astronauts, uh, of course, they can inspire the public, but they can also inspire young people to choose for STEM careers, science, technology, uh, engineering and math. 
if we want to continue to involve our society, if we want to maintain the same standards of living, if we want to find solutions for climate change, we need people that are willing to invest in new uh, technologies, in engineering, in math, in science. Look to what's happening with the coronavirus here. If we want to find a solution for this, we will need to find vaccines, we will need to find medication. For that we need scientific people, we need people that are well trained. And so astronauts can aspire young people to choose for, for these careers. So these are the four main drivers why we invest in space exploration. And then what do we do? Uh, where do we go? And Europe has decided that we have basically three destinations. One destination maintains low Earth orbit. Today, the International Space Station. And in the last ministerial conference in CV, we have uh, decided that the ISS will be maintained till 2030. So we have still 10 years of exploitation of the ISS to go. And this is actually today my area of responsibility. I am responsible for the whole LEO destination within our exploration program. The second one is Moon. Moon for us, and not only for Europe, but now also for the American, the Japanese, the Canadians, also for the Chinese and Russia, but not within the same program, is the next destination for the humans. Uh, uh, in the US, they have launched the Artemis program to be in 24 uh, landing on the lunar south pole. We will see if that happens or not. Uh, this is a US program, but at the same time, we have an international, new international program that we have just started, uh, where we have just signed the agreements between Japan, Canada, uh, the US and Europe, in which we will build a command post, we call it the gateway, in the lunar vicinity. A little bit like uh, if you go to the, you want to climb to the top of the Himalaya, you don't go from the bottom to the top, you go to a base camp. And then in the base camp you can do a number of activities and then from there you can go back and forth to the top. It's the way it's organized. Here it's the same thing. Uh, going directly to the lunar surface requires so much energy in one time that you can only do a one-shot mission like they did in Apollo times. This is not what we want to do. We want to have a sustainable human exploration of the lunar surface. So that's why we go to the gateway, which is the command post, and then from the gateway we can access different areas of the lunar surface and see what we can do and how we can, uh, can progress. And as I said, we just have signed the, the agreement uh, with NASA uh, on participation in the lunar gateway. As part of that program, we will have before the end of this decade, before 2030, we will have three European astronauts that will fly to the gateway, that will fly to the moon. It's uh, quite remarkable. Uh, so it's not anymore 400 kilometers. They will fly 400,000 kilometers away from uh, our planet. And I'm, of course, very proud and very happy that I could be part of this uh, whole endeavor to, to negotiate this and, and to build this program. I was part of the, the first meeting that we ever held on what shall be the next step beyond the ISS. It happened in 2012 in Paris. I was part of that first meeting and I've been part ever since of all the meetings that has happened. And, and now, uh, hopefully, within uh, my career time, I can still assign the first European astronaut to fly to the Gateway and to fly to the Moon. It would be a great success. And the third destination, of course, is Mars. Uh, Mars is the ultimate goal. Uh, we had the first man on the moon. I always say I hope that I will still in my lifetime see that we will have the first woman on Mars. That would be a, a great success. But today we are not there. We have so much to learn. We have so much to understand. Uh, it will be a voyage of three months. How do we keep the crew healthy, safe? Uh, how do we land on Mars? Uh, how do, can we bring them back? So there is so much still to do that today, for Europe, exploration of Mars is first of all with robotic means. We will have our ExoMars program that will fly in 2022, that will have a rover on Mars and that will drill below the Martian surface to see uh, what we can find there. Has the, is there traces of life, previous life uh, on Mars? And then 
we have also signed with our colleagues from NASA an agreement to implement the first Mars sample return mission. It's a mission in which uh, it's actually a campaign of three missions. The first mission will launch today, uh, today to this year. Uh, it's a NASA mission. They will land a rover on Mars that will scan the terrain, that will also drill inside the, the surface of Mars and take samples and leave little sample tubes behind a little bit everywhere where the rover is, is traveling. Then there will be uh, a second mission uh, that will be the Eero mission, that is the mission that will be done by Europe. It's called the Earth Return Orbiter. It's basically a satellite that will fly to the Martian vicinity, uh, stay there, be a communication relay. Uh, when the samples come back, pick them up and then bring those samples back to Earth and uh, have them uh, land here on Earth. So uh, it's the first time that the spacecraft will fly to Mars and come back from Mars in one single go. And this spacecraft will be built by Europe yeah, in the cooperation with, uh, with NASA. And then there is a third mission, which is what we call the sample fetch rover and the, and the ascender. So basically this is a mission that NASA is doing, but we have an element in there. They will launch a spacecraft to Mars that will land on Mars, uh, but then they, there is a little rover attached to it. It's called the sample fetch rover. This rover will, because there is a little time window, you have to do everything within one month, will drive very quickly on the Martian surface, go and collect all these little samples that were left by the rover that is launching this year, put them in kind of a football, uh, put it in an ascent vehicle in a rocket, and that rocket will launch from the surface of Mars Mars to, of course, bring the samples back here to Earth. This football will be released in the orbit of Mars and our satellite, the Earth Return Orbiter, will collect that football, store it inside, and then bring it back to Earth. So it's an extremely complex mission. Uh, it's, it, it will be very difficult to implement. We plan to bring about 300 grams, 300 grams of Martian soil back to Earth extremely complex. We don't know if we will be able to do it and we hope to do this by 2030, 2031, 32 time frame. This is the, the, the Martian exploration mission that we have and so you can imagine that from such a complex mission bringing 300 grams of Martian soil back to Earth, making the leap to bringing humans back from the Martian soil back to Earth in a safe condition uh, we still have a lot of work to do. So, uh, but the three destinations are important and eventually I know that we will see the first woman walking on Mars.